So um, death and temperance, let's talk about that for one moment, that pairing, death and temperance. So death is not something that one can direct, one simply must undergo it. Temperance, on the other hand, is the reverse. One must direct the process. It's all about learning how to direct the process. It's about learning how to surf the wave, control the flow of the flame, contain oneself without losing touch with what it is you're really trying to do. But it's balancing what it is you're trying to do, express, make happen in the world with your target. Yeah? What's the downside to the temperance? The downside is where one does not temper and so you become so enthusiastic about whatever it is you're trying to express that you really become oblivious of the impact that you're having, right? That's a real problem. And, um, you know, there are just so many good examples of that when you think about when people penetrate into other cultures. And, you know, they don't really get the other culture and they don't get the function of, of certain aspects of that culture. And so they start meddling and they do terrible things. So that, that would be important. So it's interesting, death works one. And in temperance, what happens is we achieve the ability to work <coughs> others or to work ourselves. And we have to be responsible in how we do it. It's irresponsibility that is the problem there. Let's talk about these two cards, the devil and the tower. The devil is from Tiferet to Hod, so it sort of opposes death on the one side. And the tower, oh boy, do I have a story about that. The tower is our crossbar. So this is an equilibriating force, all right? And, uh, and here's our devil. Um, so let me start with the devil. The devil's in the details, or the details in the, the devil's in the details. Yeah, you ever heard that phrase, the devil's in the details? It's sort of like, you start off with a great idea, and then you bring it down here, and the devil's in the details. So, okay, let's talk about the devil. This is probably one of the more misunderstood, do we have a card here? Yeah. Um, yeah, they're pretty much the same. Um, torch in both hands, figures, chain to the stand. Shin is, is like sharp like the lines too. So it, it's about the purifying aspect of that, that fiery nature. And the devil is a card of purification, mm -hmm. ultimately. Um, so uh, it's, it's uh, Hebrew letter is ayin or I. And um, what's interesting about this card is everybody looks at this and where do we all go? We immediately go into like that whole Christian concept of the devil, which is unfortunate because uh, first of all, devil, let's talk about what devil means. Devil comes from Persian diva uh, and divas or, or uh, devis or they also have them in, in, in the Vedic, uh, are just simply elemental forces. They're not good, they're not bad. They're like the workmen of physical reality. Uh, they basically um, don't exist in the moral sense at all. They're just there to do what they do. They're the little workmen of the universe, right? And that would be, you know, associated with hood, right? Which is about the machinery of the universe. So, and that's definitely, these are the workmen who run the machinery of the universe, so to speak, <laughs> divas. And divas, allow me to say, um, make really wonderful allies and very bad masters. All you have to do is think about all the stories concerning divas. Uh, genies are divas. Uh, leprechauns are divas. Pixies, and all of those. And as you well know, there, there are a million jokes about, you know, uh, you get three wishes, right? When you, I, I could go into those. You all know, there are a million jokes about three wishes. And of course, the, the big part of the joke is, is that the joke always misfires because if you try to control the divas, they become hostile and they get you. So it's about a misapplication of force or power. 
when you try to overpower the divas and divert them from their real work, which is, you know, doing whatever they're supposed to be doing, and instead you try to make them make you rich, make you powerful, make you famous, you really get in serious trouble. <coughs> Actually, I have to tell a story. It's a great one. One of my favorite stories that I always think of when I think of this card is there's a great story about Solomon the king. And there are several stories about him, actually, that are, that are appropriate in terms of the understanding of divas. Solomon had control of the elements. He could call up elemental beings. And at one point, he was trying to be fancy, and he wanted to impress everybody with how wise and how powerful he was. And so what he did is he called up a bunch of you know, genies and stuff like that, and, and he was producing all of this food because he was going to give a feast for all of the animals of the earth. And so he accumulated all this stuff and he was feeling pretty cool about himself. And this big creature, who of course was a leviathan, came up from the deeps and swallowed all the food in one gulp. And Solomon was like, oh my god. And then he said, well, when's the dinner? I heard there was going to be a big feast. You know, so Solomon learned um, humility from that experience. Well, the funny story, the story I always love is about the butterfly that stamped. Did you guys know that story? All right, it's, it's a story in Kipling. I invite you to read it in his Just So stories. But the funny thing about the story was it illustrates uh, the proper use, in this case, of his gins. And what happens is Solomon, of course, has thousands, a thousand and one wives. And they're always fighting and they're always carrying on. And the poor man can never get a moment of peace. So, you know, one day he's particularly disgusted and he's walking in the gardens you know, and, um, oh, what's her name? His favorite wife, who's this uh, very wise woman, comes out and she says to him, Solomon, you're the king of the whole world. You know, you're the wisest man on earth. Why don't you go tell those stupid women to shut up, you know? And he goes, no, 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 I can't do that. To, you know, to exercise power like that would be, you know, not good. I would be being tyrannical. And so she's like, okay. And so he's walking, and he's walking in the garden, and she follows along quietly to see what happens. And he comes into a place when he sees these two little butterflies. And the, the female butterfly is bugging the male butterfly. And she's ranting and raving, and why, you know, you know, why can't you bring home a little more pollen? And how come, uh, you know, that other butterfly has got that biggest rose? And, you know, I'm stuck over here with the daisy. And, you know, she's going on and just harassing the poor little guy. The little guy is, can't stand it anymore. And, and finally he says, if you don't shut up, I'm going to stamp my foot. And when I do, the gins are going to come up and they're going to take the whole world and everything will disappear into darkness. And she's like, oh, yeah, right. Big talker, big talker. Go on, go on, do it, do it. Well, you know, then the little butterfly's sort of in trouble. And Solomon, of course, thinks this is hysterical. So he calls the butterfly over and he goes, little brother, he said, why did you tell your wife that awful fit? And he goes, Oh, Solomon, I just didn't know what to do. She wouldn't shut up. She's driving me crazy. You know how women are. And Solomon goes, yes, little brother, I do know how women are. And he says, okay. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll help you out here. So go on over there, and when you stamp your foot, you know, I'm going to fix things. So he goes back, and the wife is like, yeah, 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 you and your big mouth, you know. And he goes, and Solomon turns his ring, and the gin's explode up and they take the palace and the grounds and all the wives and everything and they disappear into the darkness and of course you know Solomon lets that go on for a few seconds and then he twists his ring and it all comes back and so the butterfly's wife is going I'll be good I'll be good I promise I'll never do it again I'll be good and Solomon's laughing so he goes back to this walking back to the palace and he's all content because he just had a lot of fun you know and meanwhile all the wives come streaming out of the palace, weeping and wailing and rending their veils, and they come upon his wife, and, and they go, oh, the, the whole palace disappeared into the darkness, and we were terrified. And, and she goes, and that's because you were so bad. You were troubling our Lord and our husband so much. And you know, he did that just because a little butterfly's wife was giving you know, him grief. And just think what he might do to you. <laughs> and so they all were like, you know, and bowing and quiet, and they all went meekly back into the palace. And the moral of the story being that Solomon did not abuse his power, but when he used it generously to help another, he solved his own problem. So that's a little bit about what gins are like, okay? So you have to be careful how you work with them. Well, the devil represents the ability 
to manifest and to make things happen. This is why he has a downward pointing pentagram. Do you remember, uh, was it yesterday? That was probably a tangent, that story, but I just love it. All right, so here we go. You remember when we looked at this and I said, here's spirit, and then we have earth, air, fire, water? Well, this is significant. This is the elements ascending to heaven. And if you turn it upside down, it's heaven descending to earth. In other words, it's about this manifesting. So the devil is about the power of bringing things into manifestation. Huh. Now, the problem with that is addiction. It's being overly focused on the physical. So one of the things that you see is another version of our Adam and Eve, right? We've seen three of them now. And here's our third, I think three, right? Yeah, we had the lovers, and then we had another version, um, well, maybe two. Okay, so anyway, here it is. So we have um, the man and the woman, and in this case, they're enslaved. But if you look at them, the chains around their neck are very loose. They only have to lift them off. In other words, this is a self-imposed enslavement. Now, the figure of the devil himself is actually um, comes from a medieval figure that was part of the Knights Templar tradition, Baphomet. And what it represents is the human condition. Half a man and half a beast, pawn is greatest, pawn is least. Human heart and human brain, lo, the goat god comes again. Pawn, it's a nature force, but we are half animal, and then the upper part is divine. The horns, which are rather scary looking if you think about the Christian iconography, but you have to understand that cornute, or horns, actually represented divine force, intelligence. So that if you actually go to Italy and you look at Michelangelo's David, he has horns. He has horns. And you know how we have halos? Horns were another version of halos. So the horns are actually symbolic of the divine intelligence, okay? So the problem is, so the way it's supposed to be is, is that the human part and the divine part is ascendant over the animal part. And then I'm going to come back to Pan, who I just talked about a moment ago, or Pan. So the deal here is that the humans have not freed themselves yet. They're enchained to that lower aspect, the pedestal upon which Baphomet is sitting. So this is about when, in the Golden Verses, we say, look well to this and learn to conquer these. Thy belly first, sloth, luxury, and rage. Do nothing base with others or alone, and above all things, thine own self-respect. That's what this card is about. So the first thing you have to do is you have to gain control over your instinctual animal natures so that your manifestation is put to good measure. So that you're not, as Solomon was in the first story, using great powers in order to achieve petty ends. You're using great powers to achieve good ends. That's important. Including divine play, which is what the butterfly that stamped is about. It's about sort of playful generosity. But this is about the great work. <coughs> so this card is both a card of addiction and enslavement and simultaneously liberation. In its positive aspect, it's about learning to get a grip on the ability to manifest and to put it to good use. Okay? That's really crucial. So again, if we look at the devil, it's the connection between here and here, Tiferet and Hod. So you want all of this productivity, this uh, Hod, to be serving a higher end, serving that which is worthy. Simultaneously, you can have the best of intentions, but if you are allowing yourself to be led around by your animal nature, you will not manifest it in a good way. So this is about learning to think with the higher brain, <coughs> right? The higher self. And uh, the other thing that's interesting um, about this is um, you have to, oh, let me go back to Pan. And this is my own little personal thing, but uh, Baphomet is very similar to Pan. It's, it's a satyr, right? He's a satyr, you know, goat-like being, right? And Pan also had horns. 
but what's interesting is Pan is the Lord of the beasts. I mean, he's also the Lord of nature. And we are supposed to be, as divas, divas have specialized things, okay? So some divas take care of the evolution and the well-being of plants. Those are the ones we think of as fairies. Other divas are associated with mineral life, gnomes, right? Uh, and they, they're called by lots of different names, depending on your culture. Then you have Pan and humans are supposed to be the stewards of animals. So as divas work to bring up the intelligence and the evolution of plants and minerals, it's our job to be working with animals. That's what companion animals are about, you guys. It's not like I have little Fluffy because he matches my couch. So look what we've done in our world today. That's a problem. It's a serious problem. And that's what this card's about. It's about the application of force for good or for ill. Does force serve a higher sense of things? Does it serve a higher purpose? Or is it selfish? Yes. Do uh, upward facing horns or downward facing horns have different symbolism? Yeah, um, sort of. Uh, upward facing horns are antenna, trying to pick up spirit. In this case, he is spirit, and the energy is moving downward into matter. This is supposed to be about the ensouling of matter, right? So all of creation, the intention in creation is that all of creation become at some level conscious, alive, seen, vibrant, alive. Read the Chronicles of Narnia, oh my gosh. You really get it there. I mean, uh, C.S. Lewis was a brilliant theologian, among other things. Um, but, besides being a good literary critic. So, um, this is a really interesting, this is about ensouling. But, it can go the opposite way. When we become addicted, it's the reverse. We lose touch with spirit. Right? Part of addiction. Capricorn. Capricorn, thank you very much. Capricorn. Capricorn, the goat, and of course there's the goat foot god, right? Mm -hmm. But also think about Capricorn in the sense that Capricorn is cardinal earth. And Capricorns can be the greatest producers. Man, can they make stuff happen. And they can also be incredibly driven. You know? Think about that, you know, what's that silly uh, story or song, you know, about the, the billy goat that knocks over the dam? That's your Capricorn for you. You know, they don't give up, not for anything. You know, and so if all that stubborn, willful drive is directed in a well-intentioned way, it's a beautiful thing. You know, otherwise it's just the billy goat knocking over a dam. Doesn't do everybody a lot of good now, does it? So that's your Capricorns. It's a very, very intense sign. We're going to talk about the tower. This is the crossbar between Hod and Netzach. Victory and Splendor. Or Mercury and Venus. And um, this is a very, very interesting card. It's attributed to Mars. And we all know by now that <coughs> Mars is that great confrontational force that can blow things apart. And the tower indeed is can be a little bit scary. It's also attributed to the Hebrew letter peh, which is mouth. I don't think I have much to say about that, um, but I'm sure something will come to me. All right, let's talk about, oh, yes I do, hello, <laughs> words. Remember how I talked about the tower and glossolalia, speaking in tongues? Well, peh, the mouth, the speaking in tongues, but this is about that sort of divine, crazy language that erupts when we are overwhelmed by force. And you see yuds in the card, right? So, okay, let's go. This is a very interesting card. This card is about initiation. Um, and it's a, it's, so it's a card that has to do with again a movement to a higher level of organization and it's based on many of the symbols that you see so you see this uh, the red queen and the white king that's a very strong um, alchemical symbol it's about the union of the male and the female to produce transformation 
So it's about the union of the male and the female within the self, the yin and the yang, etc. And this is based on the Christian marriage of um, uh, Rosencrantz. I forget. I'm blowing the name. It's going through me. But at any rate. Christian Rosencrantz. Yes. Thank you. So it's, it's, it's about the alchemical marriage. All right. So what this card is about is when um, you have a huge influx of force. You see this big lightning bolt coming down, right? Striking the top of the collar, the top of the tower and knocking the crown off. Well, this is symbolic of a big influx of consciousness, higher consciousness or energy into the top of the head, the crown, right? And then what happens is this is such a huge thing that the, the red uh, queen and the white king are thrown out of the structure uh, and are falling downward. And so it looks like a sort of a falling event. But if you look at the Yuds, what you see is that on these two figures, the Yuds are descending. And that is, again, reminiscent of that Pentecostal energy. It's the descent of this higher knowledge. So the tower is representative of that transition that we have when we are, as I like to put it, um, you let go of one bar of the trapeze and you're flying through the air and you're really hoping that bar is going to be there when you get in that spot in space. It's where you're in between. It's a limbic space. It's a limbic space. So what happens is our ways of understanding, our structures become outgrown. And then there's a moment where you finally can't contain the new data that's coming in. And when that happens, there's a kind of a meltdown. And the structure blows apart. It looks like a disaster. It's not. It's a necessary breaking down of outworn and outmoded structures such that one can be transformed. Again, let me go back to alchemical marriage. So what we talk about in alchemy is that there's a process toward transformation. The first thing that you have to do is you have to break apart a substance. You have to break it apart into its constituent parts. You then have to purify those parts. And then they are recombined and you have a transformed alchemical being. So what has to happen is in this structure, this represents the dissolving part right this is the part of the alchemical where where everything gets kind of mashed up and blown apart herbally when you do herbal alchemy which i do i'm an alchemist among other crazy things one of the things that you do the for one of the first things you do herbally is you you macerate the herb you break it apart and then you put it in its solution which draws out the constituents which could be the the uh, solvent could be water, could be alcohol, could be some combination, could be glycerin, could be even vinegar in some cases. But at any rate, you, you have to break it up to put it in contact with the medium, which is known as a menstruum. And that's how you start to pull out the stuff that's useful. In the alchemical process, it's a very elaborate process where you do distillation, you do warming and heating and all of this stuff. That's the purification process. But this is about the first step. The first step is you got to be have the breakdown before the breakthrough. And the breakthrough is always that's represented by the yuds. It's represented by the glossolalia. When remember I told the story yesterday about the Tower of Babel. So there you are, you know, trying to build your edifice up to heaven. You think you have a structure that's big enough to hold it all, and then blam, in comes that uh, inrush of energy and the whole thing falls down and then everybody's babbling and nobody can understand each other. So there's a <coughs> disorientation in this process. One of the things that I tell people when the tower comes up is like, whoa, I bet you're feeling a little disoriented, right? You know, lots of wacky stuff happening. That's okay. This is the breakdown that has to happen before the breakthrough. And otherwise, you need to be organizing on a higher level. And you've got to, and in order to do that, you're going to have to let go of all those tried and true structures. It's a very uncomfortable process. 
a very funny thing happened to me early in my Kabbalistic career. This was probably, well, I had been studying for probably about a decade, but I don't know. I was, um, how old was I when this happened? Maybe 32 and 33. And I, I had, was approached by a group of very sort of high-level people who were in this program that I was in at the time. It was this crazy three-year program called the Human Capacities Training Program, and it was like 150 people in community just doing all sorts of wild experiments with, you know, who we were, what were the possibilities of being human. But anyway, they said, we want to do Kabbalistic path working. I'm like, oh, yes, well, okay. So I would do one month in which I would lecture on the meaning of the path, and I would go into all the attributions, and we would do all this meditation stuff, and then we would do a ritual in which we would call in that force, right? And then everything was went along and it was pretty swell until we got to here. That structure just completely blew apart on me. And I mean, it just erupted. All sorts of things happened. My best friend and I had a big falling out. This group that I was leading, you know, just imploded. It was like very spectacular. And it was pretty funny because, you know, I had to look at it and go, the tower, whoa, <laughs> who knew, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, it gave me a really healthy respect for serious path workings. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you ever are invited to be in a path working group where you do like one path a week, run. <laughs> <laughs> really bad idea. Anyway, so that was a, but it would actually, it turned out to be a really good thing for me. Because out of the gen that out of that breakdown, I then began to generate a much better, much more stable kind of system of working, which in fact I then led for another I don't know 20 years, however long that that other thing that I did lasted, and until that in, in, in its day had its own meltdown as well. And every single one of them has been good. All those meltdowns are so. Anyway, here you are, and here's what happens. So you get a structure. This is if you're going up the tree. You get a structure that works, and you elaborate it, and you think that it contains the entire universe until you go through this experience of the tower. And what happens is, is that you're being drawn. This is a, this is a period. This is a way that Netzach draws one. So because you're going up the tree like this, right? So you're being drawn to a bigger vision. Netzach vision. You're being drawn to this bigger vision. And you can't, and often we resist it. And the harder you resist it, the bigger the meltdown, the bigger the boom. You know, and that's, I think that's interesting. That's another, I identify with this card a lot because, you know, I love systems and I build these fabulous systems and I start living in them. And then when my vision wants to move on, I kind of dig in my, you know, and then I, I always get to, so I really, boy, do I know this one from the inside. So, so when you find yourself being called and then you have your whole life that you've constructed and you start to resist, 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 the more you resist, the more painful it is. Boom. And uh, I'm looking at the golden dawn. Eh, no big changes there. Um, oh, they have the tree of life on either yeah. side. Yeah. The black and the... Wait, what happened here? Uh, that's that. Yeah something oh yes uh, look at the way they did that you see look at your uh, your little diagrams it's really funny the yin what happened there is you saw it has somehow been bumped up I don't really quite know why they did that that's pretty interesting um, so this is a uh, this is Mars it's a pretty intense thing Coming down the other way, if you're descending the tree, you know, there again, you know, you have a, a vision, but in order to put it into a working system, you know, you have to really uh, allow your vision to go through a lot of changes. Your vision often has to be reassembled, broken down, challenged, tested. Parts of it have to be thrown out. There's that whole pruning process that happens when you're descending this way. Yeah. All right, that is the tower. Let's look at the star. <clears throat> so now we've got that crossbar, and now we're going, we're on our final two inner outer, right? And so 
we have the star and um, the star is uh, Zadi which um, means uh, I'm sorry about that too um, I just when I was making this chart for you I sort of had a little brain fart and I put star and so then I have to on the other side I made a little arrow it says fish hook fish hook and uh, <coughs> so in fish hook and net sock here again if you're thinking about it net sock um, is having an attractive or a drawing force on your sod and the way that it works is it's like a fish hook that sort of pulls us along, all right? From Yasad, which is the moon, the realm of the instinctual, of our emotions, and it's you're being pulled up to this kind of higher vision. In some ways, it, it's an echo of uh, the lovers, uh, I think, in the sense that it, there's that, that sort of sense of being drawn by something that is inspiring you but it's a very different kind of thing the iconography of this card has to do with the story among other things it has to do with the story of the three wise men so if you think about that um the, how the three magi followed the star through the heavens and it led them to the holy child that led them to the baby um jesus the new god there's also all sorts of things like if you look at the stars in the sky, uh, what you have there is the, supposed to be the Pleiades. And as you may know, there's a whole lot of uh, symbology, both New Agey and much more ancient. But the Pleiades are supposed to be the, the energy that is behind the sun itself. It's sort of like this constructing energy. Okay, let's go to Yasad again for a moment. So if Yasad is the template, or if it's the blueprint for final manifestation, the Pleiades would be the template behind our solar system. It's the soul of our solar system. And there, it's really interesting because there are many ancient mythologies that talk about that. Uh, so there's these, uh, the Pleiades. And um, you notice the figure of the star. Um, <coughs> let's see, what is the star? It's Aquarius, isn't it? Um, yeah, has to be. It's Aquarius. And so uh, what this is about is, is it's that, that energy that draws us onward. It draws us out of our just our emotional lives to long for something that's bigger, something that's spiritual. This is often a card of spiritual awakening. And it's an, or pretty early on in the path, I might add. And what it is that's interesting is it also represents that moment, however, that you experience when you have to release yourself from what is known and true and go out seeking this greater meaning. And you have nothing to guide you but your faith. And that's where the story of the three magi is such a good one. Because those are those guys traveling across, you know, all of Persia being led by a star and of course on the the level when you're in a moment where you're going through this transition or a person is going through this transition it's very counterintuitive it always looks crazy to the outside world but the person will say i don't know i just feel that there is i just feel that this is the right thing to be doing that's what this card is all about in this negative sense it can represent those moments when we lose touch with that very part of ourselves that gives us larger meaning. We lose hope. And interesting, in the terms of the Bach flower remedies, this is the remedy that's associated with this state, is the Star of Bethlehem, you know, which is all about, <coughs> all about hope. So when people are in a negative star state, what happens is they feel like they're out in the void and they've lost that sense of the star that's leading them on there. They're flailing around. You know, they're lost in this sort of limbic state. And that's a really scary thing. And both this card and the tower are similar in that they are limbic states. They are states when you are neither here nor there. You're in the middle and you're heading for God knows where and you really hope you're going to get there. And you don't know. 
you can't know. So, um, and uh, uh, this is associated with Aquarius, which of course is the water bearer, which is, I've always thought that was odd because Aquarius is an air sign, right? It's cardinal air, but um, there you have it. But it's about the nourishing quality of water that is both being poured upon the earth, nourishing our body, and upon the water, nourishing our souls. So it's this hope that nourishes us in a really profound way. And it, another way of looking at this card, in my opinion, is um, Victor Frankl, who was a very interesting psychologist who lived through Auschwitz and later wrote an extraordinary book called Mankind's Search for Meaning, talks about the fact that you know various people have postulated various drives for human beings. Freud postulated sex. Adler postulated power. And Frankl said, no, 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 it's meaning. He said, when I observe people in the camps, the people who made it against all odds were the people who had some higher meaning. Whether it was art, whether it was their love of their fellow human, whether it was God, didn't matter. But you have to have meaning or you die at the most basic level. This is about meaning. And it's about that meaning that draws us on. And if we're talking about going down the tree, when we, we have this meaning and we have to bring it down to nourish our whole sense of organization on the emotional level. And here's what I mean. When you lose your contact with meaning, then you fall into a state that we call anime, where you can't care about stuff. You feel emotionally flat. You feel it's anhedonia. Nothing gives you pleasure anymore. That would be the negative aspect of this card, when there's a disjunct and you've lost that sense of meaning. Really important. And what happens when we lose that point, that sense of meaning is we die. We lack nourishment. So another way of looking at that is hopelessness. Despair. Despair. But you know, not to, to lose the subtlety of it either. Despair is a fairly easy thing to spot, but you know, that loss of meaning is a little more subtle. It creates a kind of flatness, but it's equally devastating. It's equally devastating. You deprive a person of meaning and then it's pretty easy to take them out. They don't care anymore. The moon. Now we have, it's interesting, star, sun, moon, right? Oh, by the way, let me just say, this is a very brief aside. Um, one of the weirder things that Crowley did was he flipped the star, Zadi, the Hebrew letter Zadi, um, uh, with uh, the emperor on the tree of life. And um, I, I think one of his reasons for doing that was that he said, well, you know, the emperor could be associated with Zadi, because Zadi is in its root word goes back to Tsar, and Zadiks were the holy men of the um, of the Hebrew uh, tradition, like the Hasidic Zadiks. But uh, so I I see what he was doing, but that's an example of where somebody's linguistic fantasy doesn't make sense because on the tree of life it makes no sense to put the emperor down here the emperor clearly belongs up there with the empress the star clearly belongs with the sun and the moon so I don't know what Crowley, Crowley was doing there but then the other thing I would say about that too was again he wasn't understanding what a Zadik was so the Zadik the Hasidic holy men were not emperors they were not like powers in that sense they were spiritual powers. They were Netzakian. They brought meaning into Hebrew culture. They helped imprint meaning into the very foundation of Judaism. Sorry. All right, that's that. But it's interesting. Crowley isn't usually that far astray, but that was really a, a dumber thing that he did. Um, that was weird. And then there was another one that got flipped, but somebody else did it. In the Marseille deck, they flipped 
I forget it. I think it was strength and justice. Um, anyway, let's look at the moon. The moon is the pathway between Malkuth to Netzach, between physical reality and that realm of Venus, the ideal. And um, it's what we call, this is the path of the green ray. It's what we call, um, and of course, the, this card, um, is uh, Hebrew letter is Kof, K-L-P-H, and it means the back of the head, which is really interesting. Because the back of the head is the limbic brain. It's the brain stem. It's the root of our instinctual selves. And this and it's also the root of our survival capacities. You know, and the moon is about evolution along this plane where we, we come from our physical self and through a process of interacting uh, in a very instinctual way, we reach out toward Netzach, the realm of ideas. And what you have here is, if you look at the card, what you see is a process of evolution. You see this crustacean crawling up on land. That in turn becomes the wild dog, the jackal, which in turn becomes the civilized dog. And then you have the two pillars, uh, which if you move between, you have the, the sun and the moon shining down with these yods. And what it's about is uh, the unconscious mind the generative aspect of the unconscious mind, which then allows us to get in touch with this higher self. Another way of looking at this path, if we're taking it downward in the descent, is, is that we take, um, we take these higher ideals as represented by Venus and Netzach and we seed our unconscious mind with them. It's how we grow ourselves. That's a very very primary magical act, so this, and which is a lot of what we do in mystery school and when we work with myth. It's the seeding of the unconscious mind. And when you do that, when you take one of these archetypes and you <coughs> drop it into your unconscious mind as a seed, what it does is it begins to generate change from within. It's a very potent, potent force. So the moon is opening us up. It opens us up. And uh, it opens us up on a really instinctual level. And also when we come down this way, it's, um, so this is, if this is evolution over here, you know, uh, from, which is judgment, which we're going to talk about in a minute, from uh, the physical up to HUD, that's through a process of purification and it's through learning this is through nature religions this is why it's called the green ray so you know Di this is Dionysian one generates these profound experiences that act upon us through the emotional realm uh, it, it's also sort of like uh, when you look in psychological terms it would be at what we call ab reaction where you induce intense emotional states of a specific kind in order to sort of blow the rust out of the pipes. That would be kind of this card. So this is, this is about kind of an instinctual knowing. And it's either the seeding of the unconscious mind through the moon, which creates an effect or a change on the actual physical body. That's an interesting thing. And here's, this is a little out there, you guys, but here I go, it's late in the day, so I guess I'm going down that road. But mm -hmm. One of the, the things that uh, is interesting is there's been a lot of talk by looking at certain myths, especially creation myths, especially really old ones, uh, that there seems to be this idea that <coughs> human beings were actually just primates that were jump-started by these space beings who we then came to think of as the gods, the Sumerian Anunnaki myths, the Hopi myths, there are various myths around the world. but. Who knows whether any of that's true, whether ETs actually came here and jump-started us and spliced their own genes into us, or maybe it's all just a metaphor for what happens in spirit, which is kind of where I'm plunking down, but with this idea that we are all children of the stars, and there is a way that we are seated in this spiritual level, and it literally changes our physical bodies in potent force. 
So the moon is opening us up. It opens us up. And uh, it opens us up on a really instinctual level. And also when we come down this way, it's, um, so this is, if this is evolution over here, you know, uh, from, which is judgment, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, from uh, the physical up to HUD, that's through a process of purification, and it's through learning. This is through nature religions. This is why it's called the Green Ray. So, you know, Di this is Dionysian. One generates these profound experiences that act upon us through the emotional realm. Uh, it, it's also sort of like, uh, when you look in psychological terms, it would be at what we call ab reaction, where you induce intense emotional states of a specific kind in order to sort of blow the rust out of the pipes. That would be kind of this card. So this is, this is about kind of an instinctual knowing. And it's either the seeding of the unconscious mind through the moon, which creates an effect or a change. Sorry, Pisces, thank you. Hello, I can't believe I forgot that. Yeah. So this is ruled by Pisces. And here again, Pisceans are really interesting because, you know, this is like 12 house stuff, but Pisces often know things at a really kind of deep emotional level, but they have a, they, they have a hard time expressing it in rational systems, which can make them a little bit dreamy and they have a little hard time sometimes connecting what they know to physical reality. And that's the challenge of this path is to take this Netsakian material, this spiritual knowledge that's there, and you have to bring it down, you have to shine it down to the, and bring it into a physical understanding because otherwise it's just you're up there in the cloud. That's the negative of the moon. Also the negative thing about the moon card is that people can become very, not only very dreamy, but very, very uh, emotional and changeable and they're, you know, they lack rationality. <coughs> um, so that's, that's a negative. But yeah, there, thank you. That whole Piscean piece was really important. So the, the task of the Pisces is always to be able to bring that, uh, that incredible sensitivity and make it work in the practical world. Hard to do. All right, let's look at the sun. Now the sun, uh, like the star, is um, between uh, up here. So what this one is between Hud and Yasud. And um, its Hebrew letter is Resh, which is, if Koth is the back of the head, Resh is the face. So the back of the head is our instinctual limbic animal brain, that reactive survival piece. And this is about identity. The face is all about identity. And one of the ways that you can look at it is it's also rational identity. So let's think about the star and the sun for just a moment. The star connects the meaning-making part of us, the net sock part of us, the thing that makes us care about life, and it, it pours down into Yusud which is the pattern for your personality. It gives you the part of you that what you care about. This gives you the type of mind you have. So HUD, which is the organization and thought and system, it is pouring down into Yasad and it gives you the way your mind works. This is how your mind works. And the sun card is about expressing, being able to actually make the type of mind we have express itself in a useful way. One of the things that I always say about this is, you know, it's, it's often shown as this beautiful child. Um, let me see if I can, oh yeah, in the Golden Dawn, we have an interesting variation. It's two children. And once again, look at this. Remember how the star has one foot on the water, one foot on the earth? Now we have one kid in the water and one kid in the earth, right? And uh, 
they're holding hands, a little boy, a little girl. And so this is the, the, height, the whole idea about the child is uh, this is identity, which uh, we like to see as, again, it's, it's a re kind of a reflection of the Fool card in, a, in an interesting way. It's this uh, open, you know how children are so open, they just, this is if they haven't been traumatized, they just express themselves and they don't worry about how anybody's gonna receive it. They're just really a little bit out there. And that's why you have kids, okay? Um, and, uh, and again, you see the yuds coming down. So um, this is about self-expression. This card is very much about self-expression. And the idea is that you wanna be able to express yourself fully. When this card is operative, it's usually a means the person's gonna get their moment in the sun. That's if it's positively aspected. What that means is, is oh boy, now I get to have an opportunity to express myself. It's where, it's, it's, it's all about being able to bring yourself out. Um, and, and another way of looking at it is if you're going up the tree, it's you come from this level of basic personality and you go through the process of learning about who you are, learning about your identity, and then you reach a place where you can actually do something with it in the world. And that is in, in for thinking about something from the standpoint of um, you know, human development. That's something that happens, for example, like we hope, in adolescence. In adolescence, hopefully, a person has an intact emotional being, which then has to figure out, who am I? What am I supposed to do? Answers all those questions, and then becomes able to actually express it in the world, right? That's a developmental stage. Cultures also go through that development. So this is the developmental stage. When this comes up, it's about someone beginning to figure out and answer some questions of identity. You know, and in a negative sense, one of the things that can happen with the sun is, is that you can have an, an instance where um, the person is being called to answer those kinds of questions, but instead they're just sort of bouncing around in this sort of egoistic way, just having experiences for the sake of experiences. You know, and just sort of, you know, without really ever really seeking to find that kind of, what am I supposed to be doing with this? But this is usually a pretty positive card. Um, I like that card a lot. Well, I like them all. Okay, <laughs> we've been through that. We won't go through that again. Um, and uh, of course, this card is ruled by the sun, as you would expect. And it's generally a pretty happy card because again, it is solar. It is about harmony. Oh boy, two more. Judgment in the world. Judgment. This is um, our second to last path. It's between Hod and Malkuth. And so you're going to expect that this is going to in some way balance the moon, right? And um, once again, what it's about in this case is um, how do we take Malkuth our physical self and bring it up to become effective and productive in a sense in the world. Judgment is about, um, and it's also associated with the Hebrew letter Shin, tooth. And it's also the last elemental card, fire. The best way to understand this card, in my opinion, is uh, to look at the story of, um, well, there's Gabriel blowing his horn, right? So we all know that. So here's the idea of, it's the, the end of the world, and the angel Gabriel is gonna blow his horn, and all the tombs break open, and everybody rises up, right? Well, this is about the call. Now, in the hero's journey, which I'm actually gonna talk about next week, one of the things that we talk about is there's a moment when you hear the call. You know, the hero hears the call, the call to do something, whatever. And hopefully the hero rises up and takes it on 
and goes off on a quest. This is the moment when you hear the call. Sometimes the call is very clear. I'm being called to do X, Y, Z. Sometimes we're not so sure. We just know that we're being called. It's a little bit like hukma, you know, the impulse to act. But in this case, because of the, where it is on the tree, and when you look at it, it's that connection between Malkut and Hod. It, there is a sense usually of content. You know, there is a sense that there, you should have some sense about what it is that you're being called to do. Um, so it isn't just like, well, I'm being called to have an adventure. It's more like I'm being called to change the world, start a revolution. You know, one feels this moment. This is a big moment. And of course, the interesting thing about feeling the call is that usually the thing that follows right after it is resistance. And then that's another part of the cycle, which we call encountering the guardian at the threshold. But, but this is the moment of call. When you're being called to you rise up, to do something new, to leave that old dead past behind. Often this card comes up when people are deciding to get divorces or change careers or get a new job or all of that. And so there's this, I want to change. And it's, called, it's associated with the tooth for several reasons. First of all, I mean, let's think about some interesting things about a tooth. You know, when you say, I really want to bite into something, right? There's also like the lion's tooth. This is not an easy energy. It feels sometimes like you're being literally bitten. There's a way where it tears into you. This is a very potent card, a very potent force. And if you resist it, you doom yourself to stasis. What happens when one hears the call and refuses to rise is you miss the whole world that is waiting to come into being. And you're stuck dead. Static. The negative of this card is when people hear the call and refuse to change. Refuse to take up the challenge when they give in to the guardian at the threshold. What happens when people do that is they get stuck, sometimes for very long periods, sometimes for their whole lives. And this, that's a big problem. Although I always try to encourage people and just say, sometimes like, let's say this card shows up in the past. You can do that, you know, in a reading. And what happens is the person is stuck, 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 stuck. The whole reading is about the fact that they're stuck. And this is in their past. <laughs> you know what happened. And you say, you know, go back. There was a moment when you felt a call to do something and you wimped out. What was it? Go back. It's never too late. Pick it up. Do it now. Because otherwise you're just stuck, 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 stuck. The good news, however, is, is that seldom are we only given the call once. Life is kind that way. We may ignore the call, lose a decade. <laughs> then comes along another call. Hopefully we pick it up then, right? Very important. And it's judgment. It's the transformation. If we do it, we're going to step into a whole new world, a whole new level of being. It's a really important card. Okay, the final one. Jeez, you guys, we did it. Holy moly. <laughs> um, the world. The world. The letter is Tau, T-A-U. And it means signature or mark. And I, by signature or mark, I mean this is about making the mark, the final seal. So if you think about it as the energy descending the tree from Yasad, Yasad is the final blueprint and now, bam, it imprints on the physical plane. The world. The world is the final emanation. It's the end of the creative process. God exhales and the world comes into being. So. 
what this card is about is that moment when the descent imprints, when the project expresses, completes. It's also, in the, if you're thinking about the ascent up the tree, it's the moment when we take hold of ourselves and we hold on to ourselves and we rise up into the astral plane, which is represented by Yesod, where we will then suddenly be confronted with an entire world of images which can be very overwhelming, and at which point you have to be able to hang on to yourself. You have to remember who you are. <clears throat> Keep your signature. Who are you? Hang on to it, because you can become lost very easily in that astral plane. Um, this is always one of the more interesting paths, in my opinion. Um, sometimes, this, by the way, this, car, this card is also sometimes called the, um, the universe. And But what it's about is where one has to release oneself from the known and go up and open oneself to the great outpouring that's coming down from above. Open oneself up to the psychic, to the whole astral plane. And one of the meanings of this card is when this card shows up in readings, on a personal level, it's like a whole new world is awaiting you. You know, this is your opportunity to explore and to open yourself up to a whole new realm of possibilities. But you have to hang on to yourself. You have to remember who you are, what you're supposed to be doing. Don't get lost. When it shows up in a reading, what again, I usually, uh, the positive is there is an enormous possibility to explore a whole new world. That's the dancer in the world. This is actually another way of looking at it. If judgment is the end of the world, this is the new world at after, post-judgment, which is why Crowley called this card the new eon. So it means you're entering into a whole new era. Okay, and the challenge is to not lose yourself, to remember that even though it may be a new eon and a new dispensation, you're still you, the old you. And, you know, you're going to grow yourself, you're going to change, you're going to take on new stuff. But you have to keep your core. You have to remember your signature, your mark, your name, your true name, right? Not lose yourself. People do. It's like the kid in the candy store, you know what I mean? There, there's a way where people sometimes, when they're under the influence of this card, are being flooded by so many new experiences and so many new images that they temporarily lose themselves. They forget who they are. They, you know, they start trying to live somebody else's life. Not a good thing. All right. Shall we do a reading? Sure. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take the trunks. We're going to mix them up. Well, maybe, yeah, why not? Uh, if I have time. Um, let's mix these guys up. And then you can come up and you can draw a card. And we'll see what you get. All right, I'm going to have to sit down because my legs are about ready to give up. All right. Oh. Will that hold you? All right. Oh, you're yeah. Gonna have to draw, you're going to have to draw one for me. All right. I'll start with you, David. Okay, David. So this is where you're at right now. <laughs> the hermit. So, alrighty. So there you are, my friend. You're stepping outside of the system, which in fact you're doing right now, aren't you? You're setting up a new life for yourself in which you are becoming a healer. And you're going to shed light for many people. And you are the open hand that will touch others. You are also a Reiki master. So, there you go. Alright. That worked. That worked. <laughs> Alright. So, who wants one? Linda? Yeah. What did you throw on? Oh, that was just a golden dog card. card. Just tossing cards around. Yeah, throwing them around. 
Oh, temperance. Well, we know why you have this. Yes. So, Linda, do you mind if I speak to no. you? No. Yeah. Linda has been working a great deal with creating balance in her life. She's been working a lot with the sugar addiction. She was talking about how she went through her packs and she was, or no, it was through uh, Samhain, mm -hmm. and she was completely able to get off sugar. So, she's really working on balance, which, again, is a very different thing from abstinence. <laughs> and one of the things that I think has been really interesting for you is how you've been working on that process of being gentle mm -hmm. and not deprived to just deprive yourself of because that's where people often go in an unbalanced temperance is is that they they get really critical self-loathing they're harsh with themselves and that's been a lot of the work for you hasn't it yeah it's also appropriate that i'm going into the balancing pack so. oh that's right yeah. she's going into the balancing pack this spring like they yeah. that, uh, the last time I did the balancing pack, which was about 20 years ago, my circle caught on fire, <laughs> <laughs> melted my robe, and I had to say to my fire elemental, sit your butt down. <laughs> ah, the wheel of fortune. <laughs> So you're going through a period of change, a rapid change. It can be a very lucky thing if you can keep your balance in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. So you may feel rocked by old oh, things being up and down and all around. But if you can keep your balance, then you're going to be able to move toward your true destiny. Mm -hmm. Wow. Your true destiny. Destiny is calling you. All right, next. Which way are we going? Anyway, just come up, grab a card. Oh, the hangman. <laughs> There's a part of you that really keeps wanting to fly. find the right word so you can fix your situation and create your own reality and do the positive thinking thing or whatever it is. And you know what? It ain't working. It isn't working. <laughs> You have to surrender to a deeper process, and that's where your power is going to be found. Mm -hmm. To let yourself just go into it and trust that you really are going to come out on the other end okay. And not only okay, you're gonna find your power. It's there, waiting for you at the bottom of the tree. Next. All right, girl. Oh, the star. Don't give up hope, no matter what. You're on a journey. You're moving through an abyss. Sometimes it seems far away. Sometimes it seems scary. Don't give up hope. You're on the right path. You really are. I know this. I know it. Inspiration is calling you. Your anima is speaking, your higher self. It's calling you to a whole new life, to the recreation of yourself. Open yourself up to the soft parts of yourself. They're very strong in you. Let them speak. Another star. Mm -hmm. Once again, open yourself to hope. You've been on a long journey, and at times I think you have probably felt like you were off your path. You've never been off your path. You may have gone through many things. Things have died, like the slaughter of the innocents. But you haven't given up. And if you keep on going, you will find the holy child. You will find that place in yourself. And you can feel you're getting closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can feel it. All right. Mm -hmm. we got four <coughs> Next. <clears throat> we do this a lot. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Judgment. Mm. 
you're being called also to a new way of being. I think that you're experiencing that in terms of your vision quest. That that's part of what you're really looking for. It's also partly why I think you have made the decision to go on this quest, putting aside some other hopes and dreams. Because it isn't the time to give birth to those, it's time to go be where you're being called, which is someplace utterly different. Yeah, you heard that call and you've responded. So, good. Temperance, mm. you too, my friend. Temperance. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Finding a balance. Learning to find a balance between the different parts of you, between the intellectual and the emotional, between work and home, between the inside and the outside. That's really what you're being called to do, I think. And one of the things that happens is you love to always go off seeking something totally new that's somehow going to change you. But really, all you have to do is work with what you already have, which is a lot, which is wonderful. Take the qualities that you have and temper them. You don't need a single other thing than what's already inside you. I believe that. Ah, uh, death. <laughs> well, there we are. <laughs> Moving on to a higher plane of knowledge. I think this is actually good. Because you've been dealing with death, actually, in, in an external sense. You've been dealing with um, things falling away and having to take care of. But now, guess what? It's your turn. Not to die physically, but to really go through a, a whole new rebirth. And boy, I know you feel it. You've been waiting to be born. Well, you're in this process right now of moving toward that. Mm. So think about what needs to die. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad I'm not sitting next to her. <laughs> 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 the childlike, the childlike spirit. No, no dying for you. Actually, what you're going to be doing is be, be coming into a period of with, in which you are really going to be expressing yourself, totally new ways. You'll feel uh, a youthening, an enlivening kind of warmth and heat and energy, and playfulness. So look for things that are fun, really. Spiritual, of course, and self-expressive, but fun. Uh, things that draw you out and that allow you to actually reveal yourself. I'll, I'll go through that. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Another one, Wheel of Fortune. Once again, this is a time of change for you. And this is a time when you will have opportunities. Let yourself go toward what you feel instinctively is calling you. Don't be afraid. You're lucky at this moment in time. And there is going to be lots of possibilities <coughs> opening up for you. When you feel a possibility is really the right thing, just go for it. Be expansive. Allow yourself to really ride that Jupiterian energy. It'll take you somewhere. Up, down, side. <laughs> <laughs> All right?
next to her, really. <laughs> <laughs> Life spirit. No, no dying for you. <laughs> Actually, what you're going to be doing is be, be coming into a period of with, in which you are really going to be expressing yourself, totally new ways. You'll feel uh, a youthening, an enlivening kind of warmth and heat and energy, and playfulness. So look for things that are fun. Really. Spiritual, of course, and self-expressive, but fun. Uh, things that draw you out and that allow you to actually reveal yourself. I'll, I'll go for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ah, another one. <coughs> Wheel of Fortune. Once again, this is a time of change for you. And this is a time when you will have opportunities. Let yourself go toward what you feel instinctively is calling you. Don't be afraid. You're lucky at this moment in time. And there is going to be lots of possibilities <coughs> opening up for you. When you feel a possibility is really the right thing, just go for it. Be expansive. Allow yourself to really ride that Jupiterian energy. It'll take you somewhere. Up, down, side. <laughs> <laughs> All right?